Now, serine proteases, as I said, cleave peptide bonds. That's the catalytic action and catalytic thing that they do. They have specificity of cutting, again, by binding only to certain molecules, certain proteins, they only cut those proteins that they bind. They have a common active site. All the serine proteases, the different serine proteases, have a three-dimensional configuration of the place in them where the reaction occurs. Now, we'll see that that is important because that configuration is what creates the electronic environment necessary for the reaction to take place. And last of all, the serine proteases are very well studied, so we understand the mechanism of their action quite well. So let's take a look now at the mechanism of a serine proteases. I've shown on the screen here a uh, substrate uh, for the enzyme. This is a polypeptide chain or protein that the, subs that the uh, serine protease will cut. The specific cut that's going to occur here will occur between the carbon and the nitrogen on this molecule. And of course, you know from uh, the structures we've talked about in other presentations, this is the location of the peptide bond. Now, on the right side of this, of this image, you can see the central part of a serine protease. Now, the central part is the place here where the reaction is going to be catalyzed. Now, it's a little hard to get our head around some of these things. So you're going to see in some cases, I'm going to stretch bonds and stretch molecules a little bit to actually make things fit so you can understand this. Please understand that in an enzyme itself, of course, they're already better positioned, but it's hard with figures to make things fit as we would like to. Serine proteases all have a common feature of their active site. And the common feature that they have of their active site is that they all contain these three amino acid side chains that you can see located in close proximity of each other. Now, I always like to remind students that when we see something like this, it reminds us that protein folding does occur. That is that serine and histidine and aspartic acid, which are the three side chains that we see here, are not located close to each other in primary sequence. They're brought into close proximity of each other by the folding of the enzyme to make them physically close to each other as we see here. And the closeness of these is important to start, but more importantly, the flexibility of the enzyme with these side chains is absolutely essential to the catalytic function that will happen. Okay, so we imagine now that we see this folded enzyme, and that the rest of the enzyme is shown in yellow. We're looking right now specifically at the active site. Near the active site, we have a, uh, a place where the protein is going to bind, and the protein that's going to be cut is going to be uh, interacted with this catalytic triad of serine, histidine, and aspartic acid. The binding of the substrate to the enzyme occurs in a specialized site on the enzyme called the S1 pocket. So we've shown here the S1 pocket is a sort of a semicircle that's holding on to a part of that protein. We can see the protein that's going to be cut now is at the active site. Now, in the binding of this protein to the active site, you notice that the nitrogen on the histidine has an arrow pointing towards the, ox towards the hydroxide. We also note that the oxygen that's on the side chain of aspartic acid is, has a little dot next to the, the uh, hydrogen on the histidine. What's happened here? Well, in going from the previous slide to this slide, we can see that what's happened is the enzyme has changed shape very slightly. The binding of the substrate, and remember that binding of substrate changes enzymes, has changed the enzyme very slightly so that the proximity of aspartic acid's side chain to histidines has changed. That's very important. Aspartic acid here, the oxygen has a negative charge. And the negative charge has moved a little bit closer to the ring of, a, of the histidine as shown here. By this small action, the electronic configuration of the ring of histidine is changed. And it's that change which is causing now the nitrogen to be reaching out, and what it's going to do is it's going to grab that hydrogen that's on serine, okay? So this tiny change in shape that happened on the binding of the enzyme is starting the process by which the reaction is going to occur. So we can see here that the S1 pocket has facilitated all this happening. I should say in the S1 pocket that the S1 pocket gives the specificity of the enzyme. The S1 pocket will not bind 
to everything. It will bind to specific proteins with specific sequences within them. Very, very important concept. If it doesn't encounter those specific things, it won't bind them. And if it won't, won't bind them, of course, there's nothing to react and the end, this process will not occur. Okay, so the slight structural changes have happened. And we now see the result of this uh, starting to come into play. The things that the, the entities have moved closer into each other. The electronic environment has definitely changed by this point. And what we see is that that proton that was on the OH of serine is now associated with the nitrogen of the histidine ring. Now this is the first step in this catalytic process, or actually the second step if we count the binding of the substrate. This making of the oxygen with a negative charge on the end of serine is fundamental to this reaction occurring. We call this negatively charged oxygen on serine an alkoxide ion. Okay? That alkoxide ion that's on serine is extraordinarily reactive. It's ready to go do business. Now, we've stretched that S1 pocket a little bit to remind us that, again, we're bringing things into closer proximity. And that is important because the alkoxide ion is looking for something to bind to. It's looking for a nucleus. It's what we call a nucleophile. And the nucleus that it's looking for here is this carbon, which is the arrow that's being pointed from the oxygen minus down to the orange carbon. So there is actually what's called a chemical attack, a nucleophilic attack that's occurring on that carbon. We can see that the electrons that are double bonded to the oxygen are rearranging as we see the arrow being pointed. And in the next step of the process, what will happen is that we're going to see a rearrangement in the molecule. Okay? So we went from this position to this position. Notice that we had a carbon with a double bond to an oxygen that now is a carbon with a single bond to an oxygen. That molecule is chemically unstable. It's chemically unstable and a chemically unstable molecule has to be dealt with because if it's not dealt with, it's going to cause problems. Well, the enzyme has another pocket in it to deal with that unstable molecule. It's called the oxyanion hole. And the oxyanion hole helps that unstable molecule to fall apart without problem. That's pretty cool. Okay? It's going to fall apart without problem. And what's going to happen here, as you can see, is the nitrogen in blue is going to reach up and grab that hydrogen that was originally grabbed by the histidine side chain. Okay? So this intermediate that's in the oxyanion hole is what we call a tetrahedral. Okay? And tetrahedrals we know from organic chemistry are what happens when carbon has those four bonds that you can see here. Okay? The peptide bond, which is between the carbon and the nitrogen, okay, is, is going to be broken as a result of nitrogen grabbing that hydrogen. Here, nitrogen has grabbed the hydrogen. The grabbing of the hydrogen from the histidine caused the bond between the carbon and the nitrogen to break. So we've broken the peptide bond. And so part of the protein, the part of the protein shown in blue, is now free to go and do its business. It's released. There's nothing attaching it to the enzyme, and it goes and it exits. What we have done here is we have actually gone through the first part of the reaction. And in this part of the reaction is what we call the rapid part of the reaction. Okay? The other part of the uh, protein is attached to serine. It's physically attached to serine. It's a covalent bond at this point. Now that covalent bond has to be broken in order for the other part of the original protein to be released. And that's what's going to happen in the slow step of catalysis. Now the slow step of catalysis actually has about the same number of steps as the fast step of catalysis, but other things have to happen, including the movement of water into the active site in order for the, this uh, peptide to be released. Well, we see that happening here. Water now has physically moved into the active site. There's a, a molecule of water. And that process that we saw of the nitrogen on histidine taking a proton is going to repeat itself. We see it happening here. We see the arrow from the nitrogen on the histidine pointing to the hydrogen on water. So it's going to take that hydrogen instead of taking the hydrogen that it originally took, which is no longer there, on serine. What's going to happen in that process is now we're going to have an activated oxygen 
like we had with the alkoxide ion, except for here it's going to be a hydroxide, we're going to have an activated oxygen that's going to make a nucleophilic attack on carbon just like we saw before. So there's a nucleophilic attack that's going to happen in the process of this moving forward. Here's the attack of the hyd hydroxide, and look what happens. We see that the electrons on oxygen are going to rearrange. We create a, 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 a uh, tetrahedral intermediate as we created before. And now, there's the oxyanion hole stabilizing that intermediate. We now see that what happens is that oxygen is going to attack the hydrogen on that group and it's going to pull it away just like the first peptide did. When it does that, what happens is the molecule is released. So we see the second half of the polypeptide chain released. And in addition, we have the, the enzyme returned back to its original state. Gone and as it were. The cycle is now complete. So there's about 10 steps going through what I've described here. And the important thing to understand about this is that the enzyme started in one state, it went through a transition, and then went back to the original state it was in. Very much like the process I've already described, but now you've seen it in mechanistic terms. You just completed your first video of the world's best medical exam preparation. Lecturio brings the knowledge of worldwide leading medical experts and teaching award winners to your PC, tablet, or smartphone. Prepare yourself and check your progress with thousands of quiz questions customized to USMLE standards. And the very best, you can get in touch with our medical experts personally. Visit Lecturio.com now and continue with the most inspiring medical education around the globe, anytime, anywhere.